really lucky to be part of the BB Home Centre here in the UK and working with lots of really cool people on this project. Um, okay, so today I just wanted to start by uh, recapping where we were in May 2020, which was the last time this uh, working group met up in this format. Um, then I want to go on to talk about and focus most of our time talking about the global model that we've built, which we're calling WAM, uh, a wildfire human agency model. Uh, and that has a kind of land fire distribution engine in it, as well as um, uh, a fire parameterization of our agent functional types. And then I kind of want to draw out some uh, findings from that, both from a kind of uh, fire in the, in the earth system perspective, but also from a methodological point of view in terms of the limitations of our methods. Um, so first of all, why are we doing this? Um, so a couple of years back, there was a, the first fire model into comparison project or fire MIP. And basically to cut a long story short, it found that representation of people in, uh, in attempts to model fire globally in um, DGBMs are a real uh, fundamental limitation of this. If you look at the impact of land cover on fire, the models, this is a sensitivity analysis of, of the different models in the fire MIP, and they're all over the place. They don't agree on the magnitude nor direction of the impact of land cover change on fire. Um, and then there's a kind of secondary context of this, which on the left-hand side, uh, shows um, the black shows the trend of MODIS satellite observations of burned area globally. And perhaps counterintuitively, it suggests that burned area is declining globally. Uh, and the fact that we don't really have a thorough explanation of that, I think is, is more broadly indicative of a, of a lack of understanding of the role of fire in the earth system and how it's being driven and changing currently. And so we have this kind of dual context for this work um, that, that's kind of motivating our approach. <clears throat> so where we were when we last met in 2020 is we developed this kind of conceptual framework um, for building our model, uh, which kind of meshes land system types uh, for pretty broad brush land system types with this idea of anthropogenic fire regimes, which um, if you know your fire comes from the work of Stephen Pine, where he talks about first fire, second, third, second fire and third fire. And these being kind of uh, syndromes of fire management from pre-industrial where fire is a fundamental aspect of how people use, of how people manage the land, through to a more kind of industrial fire exclusionary, perhaps neo-colonial kind of um, mentality towards uh, fire management. And by kind of merging these two things together, we come up with this, uh, this kind of 16 block conceptual framework. Uh, and drawing on that framework, we, we use that to build, uh, to develop a meta-analysis of the, uh, the human fire interactions literature. And we built a, a kind of meta-analysis, a database of that. Uh, and from that work, we identified um, seven kind of key central modes of human fire use um, as a land management tool, which you can see on the left-hand side. And we developed some kind of quantitative statistics for those in terms of the size, the kind of typical burned area of the landscape where that fire is being used as well as the, the, the probability that this kind of um, type of fire will escape and become an unmanaged wildfire. And we can also see that these different types of fires have quite different spatial distributions from kind of pyro management prescribed fire up in the USA, deforestation in the Amazon and so forth. So from that database, <clears throat> we essentially took the distribution of the land user types uh, and we use that to develop uh, a model that distributes these kind of these kind of different land fire systems globally. Uh, and we simulate that almost like a competition between uh, those um, between the anthropogenic fire regime aspect of that uh, using kind of simple uh, classification trees. Uh, and we basically we develop one kind of simple tree per uh, fire regime per land system. Uh, and then essentially we, we drive the distribution of these things in the model by comparing the classification probabilities of these. So for example, um, yeah, for, so here's cropland. Uh, and so given a certain state of a cell, we would take the output probability, uh, the relevant output probabilities, sum those, and then divide by the total to get the fractional coverage of these, um, of these anthropogenic fire regimes and therefore the land fire system types. And it's worth saying that um, in order to get this, in order to get this distribution, uh, we, we bootstrapped our original data such that these thresholds um, have a kind of fuzzy 
numerical distribution. Um, yeah, and we find that this approach uh, in our paper that we've submitted recently to SESMO to the special issue, we find that it, it compares favorably both on a process level and in terms of on a numerical level uh, with a kind of multinomial regression, which is perhaps a more traditional approach. But we also like this kind of ontologically in that what we're really trying to do is specify almost like the socio-ecological niche of each of these land fire systems. So rather than viewing it purely as a relative thing, we're allowing one tree per land fire system, which allows, allows you to specify the niche individually. And then by comparing those, you have a simple empirical simulation of, of competition between them. Um, so the outputs of this, uh, this process, uh, we evaluated that against uh, something called um, the human appropriation of net primary productivity, which is a framework uh, developed primarily by our collaborators um, in Vienna, uh, who are listed at the bottom. And uh, we they have developed this metric from that, which is the HANPP efficiency, which basically um, sort of quantifies the useful uh, biomass harvested from an ecosystem by people as a function of the total biomass harvested. So basically, if you're, if you're harvesting, um, if, if almost all the biomass harvested from a given ecosystem is, is used productively, then you're going to have a high efficiency. And that's indicative of very intensive land use types. So we would expect um, the HAMPP efficiency to increase along with increasing land use intensity. And what we found is um, we had different ways of sampling our data in order to um, produce, produce our model because the, uh, yeah, the, sump, the su substantial sampling uncertainty in our database and it has different biases in it because the literature obviously is not a purely random sample. And to cut a long story short, we had two different versions of this and having gone through and parameterized uh, our model for fire use, we then went back and um, found that one version, one way of sampling the data worked better for fire. And we also found when we compared that against this HAMPP efficiency measure that we get a nice linear relationship. So in the revised, that's the kind of final version that we've landed on of this. We have a kind of very low um, efficiency of biomass uh, extraction in the pre-industrial, and then just kind of linearly increasing through these through these anthropogenic fire regimes, which is a kind of independent evaluation of the land use uh, part of our model, which is which is great. And I think this could be something that's difficult to do potentially um, evaluating land use intensity outputs. And so I think this is something that could be applied um, in for other models as well. Um, okay, so that's the kind of land use uh, component of our model um, in like very brief. Uh, a very brief summary of it. And then, okay, so once we've got the distribution of these land fire systems and their associated agent functional types, uh, we then um, parameterize these for fire use. And basically for each of our uh, seven fire use types, we parameterize uh, the relevant agent types who are gonna use that type of fire. Uh, and then we give them each a kind of uh, a Boolean map and a rate map. And so the Boolean map says, does this AFT use this type of fire in this location? And then the rate map says, if they do, how much are they going to use or how much are they going to burn of that particular um, grid cell? And we find that overall, we think we do quite well. Um, we probably do better, generally speaking, with um, where they're going to burn than how much. And that's, I think, a function of the fact that a lot of the fire literature is principally anthropological in nature. And so is kind of descriptive and qualitative rather than quantitative. But as well, I think there's a, a deficiency in or a weakness in, 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 in the, the data and therefore in our model is that um, it's much harder to do this for uh, semi-nomadic uh, agricultural lands, land use types. You see that for pastoralist fire and uh, shifting cultivation fire. Um, than it is for sedentary types, um, for example, yeah, extensive livestock farming or these um, smallholder types. So this stands for subsistence oriented smallholder. And yeah, and that's, that's kind of logical in that it's just much easier to use remote sensing to quantify fire use in a location where that fire use is being, is sedentary. And so um, you can just measure it much more cleanly in that way. But having parameterized our agent types, uh, we then, we're then able to project human fire use globally. 
Uh, and we did that from 1990 up to 2014, which is the end of the historical CNIP period. And yeah, and so in line with the MODIS fire projections uh, or the MODIS fire data from that period, we, our model suggests a decline in anthropogenic burned area over the period. Uh, and we have reasonable agreement, um, uh, spatial agreement, as I'll show you in a second with MODIS. And interestingly, the decline becomes more substantial in our model when you take out cropland or arable fires. And that's kind of interesting because a lot of these arable fires are about one hectare in size and MODIS only picks up fires uh, above 21 hectares um, consistently. So when we strip those out, we get an, an even cleaner or a nice clean uh, reduction in fire use, which equate, accounts for about a quarter of that observed in the MODIS records. Um, so what's driving that? Well, here's a global map of, of pasture fire use uh, in 1990 on the left hand side and in 2014 on the right hand side. And you can see that the majority of this decline is taking place in South America, in the Cerrado region and in the Pampas region um, in Northern Argentina. And this is linked to the substantial level of agriculture intensification that's gone on in the region. Um, yeah, and as we know, the, the demand for soybeans from China for, um, for, to meet the increased demand for meat. Uh, has led to like a, a real transformation of land management in the region. And we see that then subsequently in the use of fire. So we've gone from large amounts of pasture fire for extensive livestock farming, and that's been transformed into a, into a picture of intensive, um, intensive cropland systems with, without the same use of fire. But conversely, whereas the MODIS fire records suggest that there's also been a substantial decline in fire in sub-Saharan Africa, our model doesn't pick that up. Our model says that things have been static, if not slightly increasing in terms of the amount of fire used. Um, so why is that? Well, we think that that's because the decline in fire or any decline in fire in sub-Saharan Africa is not due to changes in human land management, uh, principally or direct changes in human land management in the same way that it is in, in South America, but is more due to um, the fragmentation of the landscape, for example, through building roads, through converting grasslands into croplands, which fragments uh, previously connected flammable fuels uh, and, and, and reduces burned area in that way. And so on the right hand side, we've got this kind of reduced complexity model, a kind of simplified model done by Archibald et al. in 2012. And basically what they find is that in very flammable, very connected fuels, the amount of fires is, uh, or the burned area in the, uh, the burned area is, insensitive to the amount of fires because if you've got one fire that's enough to burn all the connected and flammable fuels in the area and so we think our modeling kind of backs up this idea um, that really really the fundamental issue here is about fragmentation of the landscape and not due to kind of a direct fire management decisions taken by people but that sort of opens up this interesting question of in a, in a model that's driven by local land users, by the decisions of agent functional types in our case, how do you capture these more indirect effects that emerge um, from kind of uh, yeah, decisions that are not anything to do with um, the kind of individual land use decisions of our AFTs potentially. Um, okay, so just to conclude then and sort of uh, set up where we're headed with this, we think that we've developed a theoretical approach to human fire management uh, that allows us to capture global scale patterns of land use intensity. We saw that in the evaluation against HANPP, which is a, a principally an empirical measure. And then we've developed an, an empirically grounded model of human fire interactions that captures how people, where people, when and why people manage fire. But we've got a challenge in picking up indirect impacts on fire regimes. Uh, such as landscape fragmentation and these are processes that are above the AFT scale and we need to specify them top down because uh, because of the empirical approach we're taking and uh, we don't get that kind of natural emergence of these things bottom up. Um, so next what we're going to do we're going to plug in our model to a DGBM uh, Jules Inferno and that will allow us to think about and capture not just managed fire which is what I've discussed in this talk but also unmanaged fire so that's things like cigarette butts and infrastructure failure, as well as arson. Uh, then we're going to do more work on fire suppression, um, which is fire extinguishing, putting out fires. 
Uh, and then we need to think quite seriously about options for capturing these kind of indirect fragmentation effects that we found to be really important. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Olive. Um, right. With time is passed.